Okay, so bear with me, guys. Sorry, it's for the recording. So, so for for the first thing to 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 to, to take from the Murphy case, really, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Article Forty One, is is the so-called penalization test, right? If you are penalized, worse off, you know, because you're married than you would be if you were not married. Uh, well, then, prima facie, on the face of it. You know, it, you know, it's likely to be uh, at variance with Article 41 and unconstitutional, right? So we get that concept from the Murphy case. Now, the other dimension of the Murphy case, and I don't want to complicate it because we're now talking about Article 41 and the family, but it's actually a more significant case, again, in the context of the effects of findings of unconstitutionality, you know? So, like, it depends on the context of the case, but, like, what actually is the effect, impact, of a finding of unconstitutionality. Well, okay, it varies, but in the Murphy case, the Supreme Court had to decide who benefits from this or what's the practical result of our decision. And what they said was the practical result is that Frank and Mary Murphy get to recover the excessive income tax that they paid, as it were, the unconstitutionally obtained income tax that they paid from the moment that they took their case. So they got married in 1975. They took their case in 1978. This was 1982, right? So the court kind of was conscious of the broader implications of their ruling. And so they tightened or reined in the implications. Only Frank and Mary Murphy could benefit. Other married couples had to just accept. Uh, I suppose that maybe they had been but they didn't take their case. They, as it were, they slept on their rights, you know? And so obviously then from that day forward, the Oireachtas was obliged to amend the Finance Act so that this arrangement would no longer be in place, you know? So, right. so that's the effects of findings of constitutionality. So, right. Uh, then Vic Vahuna. Now, this is actually more interesting, really, in terms of thinking about the idea and what difference the family provision in Article 41 actually makes. So think about Vic Vahuna now. Again, it's fairly simple. They're challenging the constitutionality of the various legislative provisions that, that, that give rise to or provide for the single mother's allowance, whatever the payment is every month or every week. What do you think about that one? Do you think they're going to win? Una Vic Vahuna is going to win. Um, I'm reading a message here sent to me privately. So in Article 41, Section 1, Subsection 2, does it mean that mothers, I think you might mean 41, Section 2, the woman of the home clause, I think. Does it mean, yeah, okay. Does it mean that mothers are entitled to extra financial support from the government? Sure, you say it's an empty article. In other words, I say it's a dead letter, but it is still in the constitution. So could it not be argued that being not, get that not getting the aid is unconstitutional? Yeah, interesting question. Interesting question. Um, uh, it tends in that direction, yes. And, um, it was actually, it would be inaccurate of me to say it was never litigated. It was never used in litigation. I can't think of the case or the one or two cases um, that it has been litigated in. In other words, it has been introduced by a lawyer in the in, in a case in support of their argument. Uh, I can't remember, but it, it had very limited impact. Um, because if you look at the wording of it, uh, endeavor to support, you know, it's very, very weak wording in practice and it's really just an expressive provision like here ideally is how it would be kind of thing that's one reason another reason is that judges because of the separation of powers are very reluctant to dictate to government the political organs as to how to spend public money that's another reason you know so we will look at that in the context of socioeconomic rights and judicial enforcement of socio i mean this is a so-called socioeconomic right it has to do with care, like health care or like education, for instance, as distinct from the right to a jury trial or 
you know, rights to vote, for instance, would be civil and political rights. So notoriously, the, the judges, judges all around the world, really, are famously um, reluctant, reticent to enforce socioeconomic rights because of the separation of powers. That's another reason. A third reason, I suppose, is that single mothers do get support. I'm not saying whether they get enough support or whatever. Um, that's a political question. And anyway, I'm not very well informed on what, what um, children's allowance is or whatever. But, you know, which makes it hard for a woman litigant to argue, hey, um, what about Article 41 too? So that's kind of an overview answer to that question, but thank you for asking it. Um, and again, you see, that shows how I need your engagement, guys, in order to teach this class well. Otherwise, it's just me uh, and on my own. But uh, Vic Vahuna, do you think she wins? Uh, they, I should say, the family win. Okay, so I'm assuming you you think that she, they shouldn't, like in the sense of what a mean thing to do uh, is probably, I'm guessing, what you're thinking. You know, my God, what a mean-spirited thing to do. Uh but the Constitution says what it says. Do you think they did win as a matter of constitutional law? Do you think they should have won? And if you don't, what's the difference? Now, maybe that's the key question. What is the difference between Vic Vahuna instance and the Murphy instance? Just going to leave that with you for a second. So, you think about it. Uh, it's that old idea that discrimination or that it's illegitimate in some sense to treat cases that are the same differently. But it's not illegitimate to treat cases that are different differently. I don't mean law cases, I mean... So in other words, like in the Murphy case, I think the reason that Rory and loads of you were thinking, you know, they should win is because you were just treating a married couple worse than an equivalent unmarried couple in the exact same situation. The only difference being they're married or not married. And so that discrimination is, as it were, arbitrary from the moral point of view, or arbitrary or unjustifiable or unreasonable in the sense that there's no reason for it, you know? Now think about the Vic Vahuna case. In a sense, it's true, yeah, it is true that unmarried mothers are getting a state support that married mothers are not entitled to. Is that unreasonable? It is treating people differently, that's true. It's treating unmarried mothers, and I'm just gonna leave it at mothers for the moment because it actually was an unmarried mother's allowance. Um, uh, but it, it is treating unmarried mothers differently to married mothers. So if you're a married mother, you might say, hey, that's not fair. But is it unconstitutional? In other words, is, is there a justification or a reason that would render it non-arbitrary from the moral point of view. And in simple terms, I think you're probably getting there in your heads already. It is not arbitrary. It is not arbitrary in the sense that it is the state recognizing that generally speaking, un, you know, women, mothers, parents who are single parents have more difficulty, practically speaking, in terms of childcare and trying to develop and organize a professional life and so on. And so there is good reason to support them financially in certain ways, up to a certain means test, whatever it might be. So it's non-arbitrary, right? So it was not illegitimate and it was not unconstitutional. And the Vic Vahunas did not win their case despite the protection of the marital family in Article 41. But what's also notable, I think, about the Vic Vahuna case, and I'll stall now for a break in, let's say, a minute or two, is the so-called inducement test. Right? So the judge in the case was Mella Carroll, 
who was the first ever woman appointed to the high court. Um, and uh, she basically in her reasoning, which you, you can look about this incidentally, it's all written about in the Doyle Hickey book, chapter 18. Uh, you don't really have to read Vic Vahuna itself. But another, by the way, just I'll mention it now that I think of it, another good source for Vic Vahuna is the Feminist Judgments book. So uh, the, the Northern Irish Feminist Judgments book was published about five years ago, where lots of Irish legal scholars um, rewrote judgments kind of 20, 50, 70 years later from a feminist perspective, critiquing, in a sense, the judgments as they were written in the real world by the real judge. You know what I mean? So one of the cases they deal with is Vic Vahuna. Now, obviously, it's hard to get your hands on that book. Uh, I'll come back to that now in a second, Kira Jane. Definitely, yeah, I, I will clarify that in a second. I'm all, yeah. Um, but this Feminist Judgments book, the, 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 you might find it was Colm O'Caneda and I can't remember who else wrote about Vic Vahuna. But you might be able to find that uh, on SSRN or whatever. But anyway, that's just by the way. Uh, the chapter in our book, uh, let me just see your question here. Chapter 18 to 31 to 35. Oh, the paragraph numbers. Let me just see. I have it here now. Yeah, that's that's what I found in your book for them. Just if anyone else. Oh, oh sorry. I get you. I get you. Yeah, 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 yeah. To make it easier to form. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the. No, that's good, actually, Kira, Jane. Um, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, no doubt you're right. But uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah. That, that's correct. Yeah. So it's it's really, to be honest with you, everything you'd need on Murphy and Vic Vahuna would be in that chapter. And it's all covered in about four or five pages. And, and Kira has given you the page numbers there, Kira Jane. But the inducement test specifically, uh, I'm getting messages here privately. No, no reason to not ask me that publicly. Uh, oh my God, guys, I'm getting loads of private messages now. Like, why is this big secret society, guys? It's not just a Zoom call. Uh, okay, I'll come back to those. I am interested. I love when students ask questions. So I will, even if you sent to me. Uh, just let me finish out this point first on in the inducement test. No worries. That's okay. I get it. I get it. Um, inducement test. So, so whereas under Murphy, it had been understood as a kind of a penalization test, what uh, Mella Carroll said in the High Court was, look, this wouldn't induce, like incentivize, this wouldn't induce somebody to not get married. Like this, the fact that there's a single mother's allowance would not induce a woman to not get married, uh, right? All things considered. That's not to say lots of women don't want to get married or want to be, have kids and not be married or whatever. But she's saying the fact of the single mother's allowance isn't going to, so by, justifying it in that way she kind of suggested or the implication was that there was an inducement test that article 41 would be breached if there was circumstances in a legislation or otherwise that would induce somebody to not get married because remember the state pledges itself to guard with special care the institution of marriage now if, uh, i mentioned the civil Partnership Act 2010 in the book. Okay, so if you recall, 2010 is five years before the marriage referendum. Sorry now, guys, I will let you go in, 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 in just a minute or two for a break. But um, the marriage referendum in 2010, like gay people were not entitled to get married, as you know, right? So this was a problem, of course, you know, and the Civil Partnership Act was introduced in 2010 to give certain rights, pension rights, child related rights and guardianship with various rights, um, legal rights of different kinds to people who couldn't, to gay people, to people who couldn't get married, uh, to try to equalize the situation in some way. And actually at the time when that legislation was introduced, they did not make that available to opposite sex couples. It was only available to same sex couples because the idea being, I suppose, that if it was available to opposite sex cousins, <laughs> couples, 
uh, that uh, they would be incentivized to not get married, that it would be an inducement to not get married and might fall foul of Article 41. And equally, once marriage equality was passed in 2015 and it became possible for uh, same-sex couples to get married, um, the Civil Partnership Act was closed off, right? In other words, you couldn't opt for opt for the, the civil partnership, you know, uh, because that would induce you to not get married. You know what I mean? So now that's controversial in itself because uh, lots of people might not want to get married. You know, they might just have a problem with the institution of marriage. They might see it as a patriarchal institution or whatever, you know. So uh, there you go. That's what it says in the constitution. The state shall guard, pledges itself to guard with special care at the institution of marriage. Now, let me, before I find, I'm going to press stop on the recording now, but I'm going to answer 